This patient had a primary LASIK procedure in October of 2009 for low hyperopia using the Technolast 217Z and Moria 130 disposable microkeratome with a nasal hinge. At one day post-op, there was a myopic shift as would be expected, but there was a decentration diagnosed. Because of this decentration and the patient's complaints associated with this, the surgeon lifted the flap and did a topography-guided retreatment a few months later, which improved the refraction but left the patient still with visual symptoms of ghosting. As the topography-guided treatment hadn't worked, it was thought that maybe there were whole eye aberrations that hadn't been corrected, so a wavefront-guided retreatment was performed to try to correct the aberrations of the whole eye. This treatment made the patient much worse than before, most likely due to the fact that the wavefront-guided treatment had been centered on the entrance pupil in a patient who had a large angle kappa. On presentation to our clinic, the patient's manifest refraction was plus 0.75, minus 0.75 at 75, best correcting to 2016. The topography showed a nasally truncated ablation zone, and the Myers can be seen to be quite distorted in this region nasally. The whole eye higher order aberrations, which are centered on the entrance pupil, were actually not that high, although there was raised coma, and the patient had severe visual complaints. We performed an Artemis very high frequency digital ultrasound exam to measure the individual layers of the cornea, and the true diagnosis became apparent from this scanning. The flap was found to have a short nasal hinge, and the stromal surface, the surface of Bowman's layer, was indented near the hinge, but the epithelial surface was quite smooth above this area of irregularity. Based on these images, our postulation was that the flap was created and lifted out of the way, but because it was a short flap, the ablation zone partially extended onto the underside of the flap, so that when the flap was replaced, there was double ablation in the nasal zone, thus creating a crevice, which was then filled by epithelium. The degree of epithelial compensation is demonstrated in the epithelial thickness map, showing the epithelial thickness in microns. It can be seen that the epithelium is thickest over the crevice, up to 77 microns, and thinnest over the cliff edge in the stroma, down to 41 microns, a difference of 36 microns within one millimeter. This ridge can also be seen on fluorescein negative staining. This epithelial thickness compensation was masking the true stromal surface irregularity from front surface topography. This explains why topography and wavefront guided treatments did not work, since the corneal front surface determines the measurements of topography and wavefront, and therefore are not representative of the stromal surface irregularity. Therefore, a better treatment plan was a transepithelial PTK. In other words, an ablation of constant depth over a large zone so that the same amount of tissue is removed everywhere within the treatment zone, using the epithelium as a natural masking agent to target the ablation onto the peaks of the irregular stromal surface. The PTK ablation will break through the epithelium first wherever the epithelium is thinnest, in this case after 41 microns. Before the procedure, we use a process called digital subtraction pachymetry to simulate the stromal tissue that will be removed after a specific ablation depth during the transepithelial PTK. In this case, after 47 microns, we can see that there will be epithelial breakthrough centrally and nasally, and hence stromal tissue will be ablated in these locations where the stroma is exposed. After 65 microns, further stroma will have been removed from these locations, and a map of the stromal ablation can be calculated in advance. At the end of the case, a little bit of epithelium would be left at the bottom of the nasal crevice, meaning that there would be no stromal ablation at this point. We generated a topography-guided ablation profile in order to compare this with the stromal ablation map predicted for the transepithelial PTK. It can be seen that the area of maximum ablation is not matched in the topography-guided ablation and therefore will not address the main irregularity on the stromal surface, in fact, possibly worsening the irregularity. Before showing the video of the procedure, we will rotate the maps by 180 degrees to align them with the view through the operating microscope. 
We will also highlight the main area of interest, the stromal crevice near the nasal hinge, as a cartoon to give a cross-sectional representation of each step during the procedure. The surface of the cornea was dried before the first transepithelial PTK ablation was performed, which applied a constant ablation across an 8 mm diameter as shown in the animation. The epithelium acts as a natural masking agent to target the ablation onto the ridge on the stromal surface. The first PTK was planned to be 49 microns in order to only break through where the epithelium was thinnest centrally and over the nasal ridge. Inspection of the pattern remaining on the epithelium can be seen to closely match the predicted pattern with a strip of isolated epithelium overlying the crevice of the stroma. The ablation depth of the second PTK can thus be calibrated according to the achieved epithelial ablation rate observed. The second PTK was planned to reach a second checkpoint of 60 microns. Again, the pattern of remaining epithelium can be seen to closely match the predicted pattern expected after this ablation depth. The process was repeated a third time, targeting a final endpoint of 65 microns. The stroma can be seen to be exposed everywhere except for the small strip over the crevice in the stroma. This stepwise method means that the intended endpoint can be reached accurately and stromal tissue can be conserved, which is often at a premium in these repair cases. Transepithelial PTK can also have a refractive impact, which can be predicted based on the epithelial thickness map. In this case, the epithelium was thinner centrally, so a transepithelial PTK ablation would act as a myopic ablation. Therefore, a plus one hyperopic ablation was performed to account for this. This ablation removed the remaining epithelium and hence also afforded the final part of smoothing. Following this ablation, the smoothness of the stromal surface was reviewed. There were a number of microfolds remaining on the stromal surface, so a wet PTK ablation was performed. This involves flooding the cornea with BSS, followed immediately by a PTK ablation. The BSS acts as a masking agent and naturally spreads across the surface, leaving the microfold ridges closer to the surface. The shock waves of the eczema laser pulses expose the peaks of the microfolds, allowing them to be ablated in isolation of the rest of the stromal surface. The stromal surface can then be seen to be significantly smoother but this process can be repeated if the stromal surface still has microfolds. Following the transepithelial PTK procedure, an Artemis VHF digital ultrasound scan showed that the nasal ridge on the stromal surface had been almost completely eliminated, which could also be seen on the epithelial thickness map, where the localized nasal 35 micron difference had disappeared and the post-op epithelium showed a regular thickness profile. The truncation of the optical zone of the hyperopic ablation on topography had also been restored, with the difference map showing a significant change in the nasal region. Finally, the nasal ridge was no longer visible, either on fluorescein negative staining or topography.